Moab's Ancient Artists. An Introduction to Moab Rock Art by me, Rory Paul Tyler. The Colorado Plateau includes parts of four states, Colorado, New Mexico, Arizona, and Utah. Moab is in the northeast corner of the plateau. Humans have lived here for at least 12,000 years, but most of the rock art was made in the last 6,000. Most of the Indian art in the Moab area was produced by four cultures. The desert or archaic culture, often called Barrier Canyon style, from 4000 BC to 500 AD, maybe a little older than that. The basket maker culture was here from about 1000 BC to about 1000 AD. And they made most of the rock art, primarily petroglyphs, pecked into the stone. Following the basket maker, there was the Fremont culture, which may have been an offshoot of basket maker. This is in Sago Canyon. You can see the bright Fremont peckings there over the top of archaic paintings. And the fourth Indian culture that this show discusses is the Ute culture, 13 or 1400 AD up until the present. We'll start this conversation out with the desert archaic culture. Maybe as far back as 6000 BC, maybe 580, but it's imprecise dating for this bunch. Desert culture artifacts appear from Canada to Central America. They were first identified in the Four Corners region. These people were hunters and gatherers. They often lived in small bands, moving seasonally from one source to another across a defined territory. Sago Canyon is got, has got all four of those cultures, including the archaic culture. Much of the archaic art that exists today was painted. Rock art paintings are called pictographs. The Sago Canyon panel is about 40 miles north of Moab, and it is probably two to 3,000 years old. It contains common archaic motifs, including wide staring eyes, dots, stripes, snakes, and attenuated bodies without arms or legs. The Bartlett, Bartlett wash panel is about 15 miles west of Moab. You can see the wide staring eyes on the figure on the right. And on the left, some very elaborate robes or shrouds. Few archaic graves have been found, and it has been suggested that archaic people practiced a form of open air burial, creating ornamental shrouds for their honored dead. If so, some of these figures may be wearing these shrouds which were then painted, the designs were painted on the rocks as totems in a form of ancestor worship. Perhaps supporting that idea is the nearby panel. It is commonly called intestine man, but I call it snake belly. The 
The figure on the left may especially reinforce the idea that archaic people placed some of their dead in baskets and shrouds for an air burial. Note the two sets of horizontal stripes in the other upper half of the image. They could represent basketry designs. The figure's feet are extending beyond the shroud. This foot has a small set of small lines like an aura surrounding it. I know that's kind of spectral and imaginative, but who knows? There's some sort of mantle over the figure and several birds are holding the mantle and flying off to the right towards the central figure. And there's a large bird over on the left that is flying in the same direction to the right. This figure may have a snake coiled up inside of it. And I call it Snake Belly for that reason. I think Intestine Man is a ridiculous name. Just my opinion. Zoom in here. You can see the shape of the snake's head. And this is an incredibly elaborate, maybe the most elaborate uh, panel painting that I, that I know of. I can't think of any other that's quite so detailed has green paint on it. Green paint's kind of rare, but there's some green paint across the canyon. I'll talk about that in a bit. Snakes have many meanings in lore, ancient lore and religion, and because they shed their skins, one of those meanings is rebirth. Bear that in mind. The figure on the right appears to have wings like a spirit or angel and I know that's a contemporary take on it but you have to take some leaps every now and again there's his wings wing light he's, he's holding some sort of vegetable matter, and there are more flying birds on top of his wings, some flying to the right, some flying to the left. Those little yellow dots show you there's at least six birds in this picture. Death and transfiguration is a common metaphysical archetype known to every time and human culture. Could the birds be taking a dead person to a transformative deity where the body is shed so that the spirit may fly? Well, that's a guess. Across the canyon from the intestine man is a panel that I call Snake Mouth. The main figure has a bird perched on its hand. There's some big snakes crawling around up there. Can't tell if it's a raptor or a raven. Either one would work. The large figure has a green snake in its mouth and green eyes. And I call this panel Snake Mouth. And it'll, it'll give you dreams. 
petroglyphs are images that are pecked into the rock as opposed to pictographs, which are painted. Archaic petroglyphs are fairly rare. Here we see an archaic figure, however, no arms, no legs, that dot of halo, uh, halo dots around its head is a, a common archaic design element. There are several figures bowing down before the large figure. They appear to be holding sticks and some of them are dildos and we call this the supplication panel. Next to the large figure is a, an animal with short ears and a long tail. I think more often than not, such figures represent mountain lions. And if I was a god, I would like to have a mountain lion for a pet or a companion. Here are a couple more examples of archaic art in the Moab area figure on the right has the big round eyes and to his left there are five figures going from bottom to top like a tadpole metamorphosizing into a bird and I call this the metamorphosis panel for that reason. Hell Roaring Canyon is an archaic site that contains equinox and solstice markers, where that yellow dot is. And these are among the only archaic astrono astronomical markers I know. I uh, found another one after I produced this slideshow at another location. One of the uh, astronomical markers in Hellroaring is right here. It's a, This pictograph is an astronomical marker for the equinoxes. There's a four-year-old and a four-thousand-year-old. On equinoxes, the shadow from a stone a few feet away uh, creates a wide-eyed motif on the painting. You can see that little dimple in the middle of the rock. It creates a mask-like effect. Here's the shadow of the rock on the equinox. And it's, as the sun rises, the shadow moves down until it forms the wide-eyed uh, design element on the figure. Very similar to the wide eyes seen at Sago Canyon. And this occurs only two days a year on the spring and fall equinox. Another marker at the site. Here's this North Kachina on the left and the South Kachina on the right. And on the South Kachina, when the sun comes up, it goes at, behind the Kachina, but there's a small hole as the sun shines through that you can see if you're standing in the foundation of an archaic ruin. There's one small base of one small building up there and if you're in that ruin you can see this site. The South Kachina staring through the hole at you and this uh, alignment occurs only twice a year from that location. Now we'll move on to the basket maker people. And they were here from about 1000 BC until about 1000 AD. Basket maker artists made the most rock art in the Moab area. And their art is very representational compared to other rock art styles around the world. And it makes it easier to interpret the art Basket maker motifs include hunting, especially fighting, fertility, and astronomy, 
and they were the first in the region to grow corn and squash, not beans. Still, their art lacks agricultural themes. Hunting motifs dominate, as in this example of a basket maker hunter throwing a spear at a sheep. Bighorn sheep once roamed the entire region. It's estimated there were up to 2 million bighorns, desert bighorns on the Colorado Plateau, but European sheep diseases, grazing, and hunting practices took them down to between two and 3,000 by 1930s. There are now about 35 or 40,000. Mountain lions and people hunted bighorns, and those are all common elements in basket maker art. I call this the Rosetta panel because it provided several important clues for understanding basket maker rock art. In this panel, a short-eared, long-tailed animal, probably a mountain lion, appears at the upper left. The segmented feet, tined toes, and distinct claw marks are diagnostic design elements for a basket maker lion. These design elements appear throughout the basket maker region, but they are most common in Moab. A sheep hunter seeking power for his hunting magic would naturally turn to a lion's spirit, and to shortcut the artistic process, they just used. The paw print, these are all from the Moab area. You can see the segmented feet and the tined toes. This one here is about my favorite, beautifully done. It's in Hidden Valley and it is probably a winter solstice marker. So that's all Moab. These are in Canyon de Chez National Monument couple hundred miles south in Chinle, Arizona, pretty much in the center of the plateau. And these are in the Petrified Forest National Park near Holbrook, Arizona. Almost to the edge. I've also seen photographs from Las Vegas with that symbol, but I have never been there. This track is on a large panel just a few miles east of Moab. You see the segmented foot. Tine toes, distinct claw marks, and he is in the company with other predatory glyphs, including glyphs that resemble fences or corrals, those intense cross hatched lines, and also any linear element may represent a containment element, a containment symbol. Indians throughout America captured and prey in game drives, often using fences and corrals. In this case, there is a sheep inside the trap, right there. How did that happen? He's pretty firmly trapped. Well, above the potash panel is Poison Spider Mesa, and the bighorn sheep, probably during the fall rutting season, would come down a natural passage to the river to drink. Then the Indians would drive them upstream to the potash panel, sheep don't like water, where they would trap them between the cliff and the river. If they went into the river, they would be at a disadvantage also. The split-tipped lines and the ends of the Lines are diagnostic trapping motifs. Here a sheep is inside a bag, and at the top of it there are the split tips. This is an abstract rather than a representational symbol, but it appears time and again in hunting scenarios. Here it is. Uh, people often call this a centip centipede, but I think with the cross-hatched lines and the split and tip, 
It represents a trapping deity that I call Trap Man. And Trap Man often appears in places that would make good game drive sites. This is the largest Trap Man that I know of in the area or anyway. And it is on a boulder where the topography goes from very wide, very good bighorn sheep habitat. You can see the dot up on the left show. Now the right shows where it is. The canyon goes to a narrow slot, and this is a good place to trap uh, the sheep. The cross-hatched lines are uh, a diagnostic design for containment. The trap man motif may have existed in the West over a broad range in many ages, well before the basket makers. Up to the left, that is Hart Mountain, Oregon, and this 7,000-year-old glyph from the desert culture resembles the trap man design, and it may have been an early example of the motif. Now, down on the bottom of the screen, on the Arizona-Mexican border, the San Pedro River forms a narrow canyon between two desert mountains, and there are petroglyphs on both sides of that narrow canyon. And they are, that includes trap man style glyphs. This picture is from Moab. There's the cross hatched lines, and above them are hand holders. Hand holders were probably uh, game drivers, part of, the, part of the hunting action. Here's another example very intense fence line. Two sheep on the left, maybe not sure where they're going anymore. And on the right, there are hand holders, keeping them from disappearing that way. A game drive might call for large groups of people, and here are large groups of hand hunters at a big game drive site. And they are directly across the canyon from the largest piece of escape terrain in that game drive. So it's a good place to have whole bunches of hand holders. The basket maker hunters used atlatls mostly. The atlatl is a spear and throwing stick combination. And this pose is diagnostic for atlatl throwers. You see this pose in basket maker art all the time. It'll kill something at about 100 feet. That is the, bas the atl atl pose. And there it is again in basket maker art. And there it is again. And the figure here has a distinct Moab style headdress, a single appendage coming from its head. Uh, and most atl atl throwers in Moab have that headdress. Uh, here's a photograph of a typical basket maker burial, buried with three bunches of hair, two buns on the side, and one tied up behind the nape of the neck. The women were buried uh, without their hair was cut off. It was used for ropes, baskets, f fabric, and leving, uh, leggings. It was very durable and uh, warm. But some of the basket maker male burial, burials show a different hairstyle. It's a long braid coming from the top of the skull. Right there. And could this have been the mark of honor reserved for the best hunters and warriors? You only got to wear that hairdo if you were a great hunter or a great atl atl thrower. And because he is a sheep hunter and the braid resembles a mountain's tail, I call this figure the cat in the hat. There he is with his addle addle. The bird head motif gets to throw the addle addle in Moab sometimes. He's a visitor from the San Juan River a hundred miles south. And here a bird head and an addle addle thrower face off in addle addle pose probably in a form of ritual warfare or contest. This is in a kind of a 
an arena-like setting. Here is the confluence of Mill Creek, a big hunting panel up to the left. On that hunting panel, there's a bird head. He even has duck feet. He's chucking his atlatl at the, at the sheep. And nearby, just to the right of there, there's another bird head, but he's fl playing the flute for the hunters, keeping the action lively. Sometimes the cat and the hat traveled the bird head country, as in this panel from northern Arizona. And in this case, the bird head, who is on the right, has his atlatl stick in his hand, and he's chucking an atlatl right through the middle of a cat in a hat. Looks like the visiting team lost to this match. Another interesting uh, basket maker image is the one I call the rake head. And he appears in several contexts. Uh, in game drives, he is often on the edge of the action, but he doesn't hold hands. He's not throwing the addle addle. He appears to be observing and watching, kind of like the uh, guide of the of the hunt. And the golden marks here uh, show two of the four rakeheads who are watching over this large game drive site from a distance. In the middle there are addle throwers and game drives and running sheep, but these guys are just keeping an eye on things. Uh, rakeheads may have performed several civic roles useful to a successful community, overseeing the hunt, conducting a healing, keeping order, organizing defense, warfare, weddings, etc. Rakeheads often appear at large social sites, like here, at the confluence of Mill Creek. The confluence was heavily inhabited, and these uh, rakeheads were, may have been fulfilling those roles of judges, teachers, priests, executives, sheriffs, and so on. This is the heaviest collection of rakeheads that I know of in the area. After a successful hunt, it was time to celebrate. And the celebration panel is at the end of a two-mile-long game drive corridor that has a 100 panels and 3,000 glyphs in it. This is one of the very last panels in that whole corridor. The cat in the hat is standing there at le upper left with his addle addle at ease. There are over 170 glyphs on this panel, including 19 flute players. We can see one of them right here, and here's three more. The nearby canyon is thick with cooking debris, fire cracked rocks, and charcoal. Another example of a successful hunt. And there's more addle players here. That coiled up snake may represent a net, but that's a guess. There's more flute players there. Some basket maker rock art is astronomical. It marks the changing seasons, especially equinoxes and solstices, for example. When this goose lays a silver egg at the dawn of the first day of spring, you can see the four geese, long necks, short bills, short legs, and little goslings underneath them. There's seven little goslings down there. After the egg hatches, these nearby sheep start dancing, walking, dancing on the sunshine on that same morning. And then a little later, the line of sheep below them do the same thing. At the start of the summer, at another location, the sun shines on this 20-foot snake making a, an arrowhead shape. Watch this. I figured this out in 1997. I saw this glyph for the first time in 1994. 
but I didn't figure the light out until 1997. Up to 100 people go up there in the summer solstice. Fertility themes, while not as common as hunting themes, are well represented. Here's the Rosetta panel. It contains an important female fertility icon, a vagina penetrated by a phallus. And the inverted U with two dots is seen only in Moab. The largest such symbol is next to the portal where the Colorado disappears into the canyonlands. It's nearly a foot high. The rest of the figure was probably painted. It's on a boulder, the closest boulder to the portal, which is the wetlands, which is life-giving and wet and needs little explanation. About four miles up that canyon, an identical symbol appears at Cane Creek's birthing rock. Anatomically correct, the inverted U with the two dots only appears in a few places around Moab. This panel also has a woman giving birth. There are tears running down her face. The umbilical cord is severed and there is a spear laid across her belly to bless her newborn son's power as a hunter. There's bunny tracks there, too. I wonder what that has to do with fertility. Those are the only bunny tracks I know. They're just to her left. The birthing rock also contains this figure. Most people think that this is the figure giving birth, but actually she is holding the fertility symbol, the inverted U, with two dots between her legs. She is not a birthing, but she is definitely a fertility goddess or the Mother Earth. She was abraded and polished by so much paint and rubbing. That's where the ceremony's center was. A nearby cave just up the hill from there is suggestive of female activities and magic. Other female symbols along Cane Creek include a very pregnant woman there she is. Large hands and feet are diagnostic of basket maker art. And closer to the portal, there is a breech birth. Only the necklace and the baby were pecked out. The rest of the figure's body was probably abraded and painted. The paint is now gone. You can still see her hair buns. The necklace was pecked in and then the body and the legs spread wide as to let the new baby out into the world. And King Creek has the highest concentration of female images in the region. The next group I will talk about is the Fremont. They took the necklace, the, love, the basket maker love of the necklace and amplified it. The Fremont were probably originally from the basket maker culture and they migrated north into uh, the Tavaputs Plateau, the Uinta Mountains, Salt Lake City. And over the centuries, they became a distinct culture of their own and very successful. The Fremont Indians grew corn and beans, uh, they made pottery, and they built stone structures, including many granaries. This example of Fremont art, the brightly pecked petroglyphs, are over the top of some archaic paintings. This is also Sago Canyon. There's not much Fremont art in Moab, per se, but this is a nice example here. Again, we see the, uh, the elaborate necklace. And we see uh, some sort of headdress horns and earrings. We see the fingertips. Maybe the fingernails were painted and a belt. And the rest of the figure was probably painted on, but most of the paint is now gone. The figure appears to have been pecked over the top of some earlier spiral petroglyphs, 
probably of basket maker origins, but they are more re there's more patina on them. Repatinated is the word we call it. The last ancient Indian culture was the Ute. They were here from 1300 to 1400. They moved in after 1300 when the basket maker and well, when the Fremont and Anasazi cultures collapsed after a 75 year drought. The Utes basically used everything from the Continental Divide out to the Great Basin. That was their home territory. Their art is notable for shields, buffalo, and horses. Horses did not become common in the West until a little more than 300 years ago. They were. Re this panel, north of Moab, shows a buffalo, and there was a wet spell around Moab between 14 and 1600 AD and the buffalo moved down from the north. There are also vagina figures here and a man on horseback. These are definitely vagina figures but not like the ones that the basket maker used. And the Ute Indian art seems to be a little more direct perhaps a coitus no doubt about this one what's going on with that there's not a lot of youth art in the area and the last group i would like to talk to is the contemporary artist the group i call the bubba culture from 1800 a.d unto the present bubba art is notable for its egocentric messaging motifs, its lack of connection to or respect for past cultures, the uh, techniques that are the Bubba's use include scratching, gouging, charcoal, axle grease, abrasions, more charcoal, chalk bullet holes, and spray paint. You can see some 4,000-year-old archaic paintings up and to the right there. The Bubba culture is still extant on the Colorado Plateau, and signs of it are everywhere. You can observe it firsthand. This particular example was removed. I, I made 16 trips up there in a six-week period to take it all off, and during that period I never saw anybody from the government, even though they knew it, the first day it was there. Moab rock art includes at least five distinct styles spanning nearly 6,000 years, and in my opinion its value is incalculable. This show was presented by me, Rory Tyler, and 300 generations of Moab artists. To take this selfie, I have to be about 30 foot up on a nine inch ledge you get a little bit of the crazy look in your eyes when you do things like that. And that is the end of this show. Thank you for watching.